Josh and his team and God just moving already today. Come on, just give it up. Come on. Uh, this is a bonus. This is like a pre-bonus. I'm not even, I'm just going off script right away. I uh, got a word uh, from Dave Rawlings uh, while, before the message. He goes, Luke, you're carrying a burden. I'm like, oh, no, not some of more of this religious stuff. He goes, you're carrying a light burden. <laughs> yeah, come on. That's right. Right? Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Chris Lehman, you're carrying a light burden today. Yes. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And that's who we got saved into. And that's what I declare over us today is we, we carry light burdens. Because we're yoked with who? Jesus. And he's the one that does the heavy lifting in our lives. Come on, and that's what I came to talk about. That's what we came to, to sing about, to get excited about today. And I, and I prophesy that over this whole entire congregation. If you're carrying a heavy burden this morning and you feel that thing snap off, give a shout. Just give a shout, because that's what this is about today, is just helping us transition from a Pharisee mindset to a disciple mindset. And that's what we're going to be talking about that today. So I'm so excited to share this message with you guys. It's changed my life. It's continuing to t change my life. And I'm hoping that it changes your life this morning as well. It just gets you one step closer. Uh, uh, I told you that was just my intro. I, that was like a bonus intro. Um, just thanks to Jason and Nancy for this opportunity to do what I love to do to talk about what I love to talk about, and to talk to who I love to talk to. I mean, come on, what an awesome opportunity. You know what I mean? I just, I, yeah, I don't, even, I, don't even, I don't want to say any more about that. I just, I just thank you so much. This is one of my best friends. He's my mentor, and I'm so proud of him. And I'm so happy to go to this church. It's, is, it, is it sometimes a little rocky? That sometimes we sing the songs I want to sing? Yeah. Always, right? Josh always sings the songs I want to sing. Right? But it's worth it, man. There's been so many people in this church that when I've needed them, have dug in with me. They didn't have necessarily all the answers, but they're there for me. And that's why I go here, because I know I can count on that. And not only that, they'll send you if God puts a call in your life. They'll say, okay, you want to do that in this town? Go for it. I bless you. And I love that. It, I love being a part of this, this uh, church. All right. My title, I was, I was toying around with several titles for this message. It's going to be from John 10 uh, this morning. And uh, I think it goes a little about, it's all about sheep today. Okay, John 10 is about sheep. And I, I, can't, I settled on this one, and you know what's coming. I'm going to have a few jokes for you. And they're all are going to be about sheep today, my jokes. Um, you know, because I, I believe that God... I believe that God, before he does heart surgery, likes to, you know, soften us up a little bit, make it a little, little bit of fun before he does something big in our lives. <laughs> what's that word? What anesthesiology? I think that's what jokes do. It's like the laughing gas. You know what I mean? So I just kind of get you all laughing and then I just, you know, you know, put it in on you. You know, you're like, what, what just happened? Got your wisdom molars removed. I don't know, you know, whatever. <laughs> I thought that was funny, but you know. I, I thought it was funny too. Thank you. All right, I got some people out. I got some of my people out here today. So this one's called "My Sheep Hear My Voice." Bah. <laughs> See, my boy, the son. He's he knows all my jokes. He knows what's coming. Yeah, he will. These are my jokes. Jokes so bad, they're good. <laughs> he's, he's rolling over. He's having such a good time already. I hope that for all of you. I hope that for all of you. At some point, the Lord just knocks you over and you roll around like my son plays because the Lord has given you so much joy. And if God does that, I give you permission to do it. All right? And I'll probably join you. So... <laughs> What do you call a sheep covered in chocolate? 
a candy, a candy bar. <laughs> this one's for, uh, if you know our history here uh, at Journey, you'll like this one. What do you call a Protestant sheep? A Baptist. Anyway, you know, I, mean, I thought it was appropriate for, you know, the whole Baptist connection and us coming together, you know, like that. One more, and I saved two of them just in case it gets a little dry later on. <laughs> in case we need a little uh, medicinal later on here. Uh, what do you get if you cross an angry sheep and a moody cow? An animal that's in a bad mood. <laughs> Hey, you know, I thought so. All right, here we go. All right, here's my objectives. You guys know me. I'm a, I was a teacher by trade, and I still like to teach, and sometimes I preach and even throw a little prophecy in, so it's great. I want, I want us to understand that following God is very simple. This is one of my goals today. I want you to know that it's going to, I want you all to be like, okay, it actually isn't that complicated. I didn't say it was going to be easy. Don't mix those two up. Simple doesn't mean easy. I want us to have a renewed clarity and purpose when we walk out of here. And I want us to walk away armed and ready to love people this week. And with that love, drive back the enemy from our land using love. And I, by the enemy, I don't mean people in any way. I mean powers, principalities, spiritual wickedness, and high places, and demons. Love is our weapon. Simplicity is our weapon. The enemy likes to make things so complicated. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to give a, 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 a theological background on the simplicity of this thing. Uh, this is actually message three of three. When I started this thing a couple months ago, I didn't know I was going to have three, three messages. I would say that this ser- series should be called, How Do You Know It's the Father's Voice? Or How Do You Hear the Father's Voice? The first one was about, are you weak carrying a heaven burden? We gave the Catmobile story, and I shared with you a prayer exercise about how to become more like a child and how Lord had used that in my life to do so. The next one was entitled, Hearing the Father's Voice, Two Ears and One Mouth. All right? I I gave the Muskie story and how he cares about every single little detail of your life, which actually connects to Jason's anxiety anxiety passage that actually came straight out of that anxiety passages. All right? He wants you to talk to him about every little thing. And if you have trouble believing that he does, it's actually an issue of faith, and you can ask for more faith. We talk practically about how to get more faith. Number three today is the sheep hear my voice. Bye. (laughs) He fell over again. You know, this is is great. There we go. We got a little bit of joy back over there. I like it. Yeah, more of that, Lord. We need more of that laughter. You know what? Because that's the kingdom of heaven. That's where that comes from. It's, a, it's, it's one of the gifts that God has given us. All right, so today is going to be a contrast between the Pharisees and the disciples. Okay? We're going to use this, Pharisees and disciples, to be our lenses today. All right, everybody put your... Put your Hands like this, okay? Put them up to your eyes. Yeah, I like this group of people. This is exciting, yeah. <laughs> this is awesome. Pharisees and disciples. Everybody say, bah. bah. Hey, hey, you got them all warmed up for me. This is amazing, all right. So that's what we're gonna be contrasting view is how the Pharisees viewed the world versus the disciples viewed the world. And it was very, very different. I'm going to be real honest. A lot of this came from watching that Chosen. Like, I don't know if anybody watched that. Like, man, like, I just, I just keep getting touched by that thing. I mean, they just saw it so differently. I really feel like that, that movie, that series, contrasts the Pharisees and the disciples so well, but also gives hope for the Pharisees as well. Like, um, so I don't, what I don't want people to walk away is feeling condemned as I talk about this, because I am going to do some hard-hitting stuff. 
but you won't even, you know, hopefully you don't, you know, I, I don't want you to walk away out of here condemned, but remember most of, a lot of what was written in the, like the, the New Testament, a lot of the teachers were the ones that could read were actually the Pharisees. All right, so a lot of them, they believe, actually got saved, and that's a big part of why they're in this, this is what they believe is why they're part of the story, is because they can come back to and say, that's how I was, and now look how I am. Okay, well, and again, I read a little bit into that, but you know, you know, the, the, uh, the Pharisee police can come get me later for that, you know, interpretation. All right. <laughs> Maybe some of you are worried about those police coming to get you. Well, they have come to get me several times, and here I am. I'm still free. So they've tried to get me. I've been in their prison a time or two, let me tell you that. And not only have I been in their prison, but I've been the one that has been the one condemning and looking for the little thing. So I, I can relate well. That's why I say I, can, I feel like I can talk about the Pharisee. It's because I feel like I've been saved and am being continually saved from being a Pharisee in that mindset. So I, say, so I bring these things up with all... And, and as much humility as the Holy Spirit has allowed me to let, walk in. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right. John 940. I'm actually going to start at John 10. But I'm going to read two verses before that. So I'm going to read John 940 to John 1013. And this is actually really, I, I love this passage of scripture. I've come over to it many different times in my life. <sighs> is it? it but the context of this, some of them like most quoted verses, the context of this is super important. And it says this, some of the Pharisees were standing nearby and overheard these words. They interrupted Jesus and said, you mean to tell us we are blind? Like, capture that. Like, that's a lot of nerve to tell Jesus something. You know what I mean? Like, to think about that. Like, they really didn't know who this guy was. Jesus told them, if you would acknowledge your blindness, then your sin would be removed. But now that you claim to see, your sin remains with you. John 10, here we go. Jesus said to the Pharisees, now he directly talks to the Pharisees. So this whole thing about what his kingdom is like is not actually to his disciples. It's actually to his Pharisees. But the interesting thing was the Pharisees had no idea what he was talking about, and the disciples had every idea what he was talking about. Because when they didn't understand, he explains it to them later. And it, it, they're very descriptive about that. I think that's an important point. Jesus said to the Pharisees, listen to this eternal truth. The person who sneaks over the wall to enter into the sheep pen, rather than coming through the gate, reveals himself as a thief coming to steal. But the true shepherd walks right up to the gate, and because the gatekeeper knows who he is, he opens the gate to let him in. And the sheep recognize the voice of the true shepherd, for he calls his own by name and leads them out, for they belong to him. And when he has brought all of his sheep, when he has brought out all his sheep, he walks ahead of them and they will follow him. And they are familiar with his voice. But they will run away from strangers and never follow them because they know it's the voice of a stranger. Jesus told the Pharisees his parable, even though they didn't understand a word of what he meant. So, so Jesus went over it again. I speak to you eternal truth. I am the gate for the flock. All those who broke in before me are thieves who came to steal, but the sheep never listened to them. I am the gateway. To enter through me is to experience life, freedom, and satisfaction. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, and the NIV version it says, kill and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Woo! Woo. Elliot just got touched. Let's go. Thank you. Yeah. And he goes on to say, I am the good shepherd. And he goes on to describe more about himself and actually reveals the Father. And I talked about the Father a lot in the first two messages. All right, I'm going to focus right now on John 10, 3. And it says, And the sheep recognize the voice of the true shepherd, 
For he calls his own by name and leads them out, for they belong to them. Okay? So back to the Pharisee versus disciples. The Pharisees in this story are totally distraught by Jesus, his disciples, and the way that they live their lives. These are part of a people who are doing everything they know how to hear God and to do as well. Like these guys are legitimately trying to follow God as hard as they can. I think that we like almost villainize them too much sometimes. Like, oh, yeah, well, I'm not a Pharisee. I've said this, man. I'm not a Pharisee. No, I, I would never be like that. Well, I've got some stories I'm going to share with you today that show the entire opposite of that. These are part of a people, they are religious in prayer and giving and following the rules. They are so concerned about salvation, they make sure every else, everyone around them is following the rules that they see. And out of concerns of, for their souls, they confront everybody and everything with a huge set of rules that's so, so, so difficult to follow. Now, the disciples in this story are all in super fans. At this point, they're just like, oh, yeah, we're in. I don't even care what you say. It could be as crazy as crazy could be. Jesus, we're in. The rules that they, that they saw the Pharisees enforce only, only to draw, only, they felt their whole lives that those rules only drove them further away, separated them further from God because they knew they couldn't eat right. A lot of them were in poverty. They couldn't provide for their families. They had to eat. They had to fish. Like they had to, sometimes they had to work on Sunday, right? Sometimes they couldn't shut it all down. Sometimes they couldn't put their mats where they had to walk and all kinds of these weird rules, right? It just made them feel further away like they never live up. But this time, right, they, but they knew, they know how much they've messed up. They, they feel it all the time. But now these guys have learned to run to Jesus and not away from him. These guys have said, you know what? I'm, it's not about rules. It's not about condemnation. It's not about am I pleasing God or not. They've learned to run to him. They see him touching lepers, giving women a place in leadership, rebuking the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, and they help them break their own emotional baggage that keeps them locked up. The Pharisees view God as a taskmaster ready to punish any insubordination. Salvation comes from penance. Their job is to follow the rules and make sure everyone is too. They are God's God's servants ready to militantly enforce and follow the rules. The disciples view God through the lens of Jesus. Jesus is a caring and tender shepherd, full of forgiveness and kindness. They viewed him as a friend who cares for them, who leads them. I mean, think about it like this. What if Jesus, would you invite a friend to go on a, would you invite, would you invite somebody that's not a friend to go on a three-year camping trip? <laughs> no way. <laughs> I don't want to be stuck out there camping with them. I mean, that, I mean, if Jesus said, you know what? Hey, Luke, I want to go on a three-year camping trip with you. I'd be like, I'm in. I love to camp. Some of you'd be like, I'm out, Jesus, you know, but you know, he, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right. I've got a little video that hopefully we can play here that helps um, that helps us maybe illustrate this. As Elliot, the team cues us up. All right, I've only seen this video before. Oh yeah, little sheep, help him, help that sheep. There he goes. There he goes. Oh no. Oh, sheep. I tell you what, I relate to that sheep so much. Like, <laughs> the disciples, okay, so how would, how would the disciples view that situation, right? Jesus helps his little sheep out. Do you think they're worried about Jesus, you know, putting them down as a sheep? They're like, I'm going to go for it. Here we go. Ah! And what happened? Right back in the hole. Why? Because they know Jesus is going to go right back in that hole and pick him out of that hole again. That's the paradigm that they lived under. The, the, the Pharisees, 
they probably would have shot, they probably would have shot that, that poor sheep if they had guns in the Old Testament, New Testament. You know what I mean? Like, that, that's how they would have been like, you can't believe you fell in that hole again, you silly sheep. <laughs> You know, and that, but that's the way they treated the Father of God. That, that was the lenses that they put on. That's how they viewed it. You couldn't be more opposite. So let's bring that out. Are you a servant of God or are you a friend of God? If you could zoom out a little bit and observe yourself, you could just zoom up and hover, okay? You could just watch yourself interact with people around you this week, how would they see, how would they describe your behaviors, how you treated them, how you interacted? Would they call you more of a Pharisee or more of a disciple? Now, the whole point of this is not to like grind it in and be like, oh, there's a lot of mixture, right? If we get real honest with ourselves, there's a lot of times where I can, you know, I want to say, oh, I believe in the reality of that he's a, that, that God calls us friend and that's where I live at. But the reality is, ask my family, sometimes I'm the condemning guy that just wants to put the sheep down when he falls in the hole. And I want to blast and be like, oh, that's, you know, just cut him off. All right. So part two of this thing. So that was part one, servanthood versus friendship. So the part two is, how do we know the voice of the shepherd? Uh, I got a story. <laughs> this, is, uh, this, is, this is somebody that interacted with us quite a bit. I mentored this young man. And I call it the wallet story. So this young man uh, that I was mentored was going on a God journey. Anybody ever been on a God journey? I've gone on lots of God journeys where I just say, you know what, Lord, this weekend is yours. This day is yours. I'm just going to. We're just going to spend time together, and we're going we're gonna to figure some things out. I want you to speak to me, God. So this young man I was, li- was, was mentoring was going, on a God jur- was going on a God journey, and he made it even more difficult on himself already, high expectations, with no money, with his bicycle, a, back ha- a backpack, camping gear, and some food. <laughs> According to him, God was leading him to drive to Starved Rock State Park, camp there a few days, and bicycle back home. He started on his journey. Spiritual quest. Like I said, I'm not making a lie. They're actually important. I I think they are. They do have a purpose. But all along the way, he finds a wallet. Not, no joke. In the wallet... Now, this was, a, this was a journey with, no, like, it's supposed to be about God's provision in his life. He finds a wallet along the way, opens it up. He's like, $300. He decided that this was God telling him to take the money and use it as provision for his trip. Ooh. <laughs> He's an excited sheep, guys. There he goes. Woo, right in the hole. Oops. <laughs> He, he, uh, he used his money in joy to stay at Starred Rock State Lodge, eat at restaurants, and he really lit it up for the rest of his journey. <laughs> My takeaway from this is in our zeal to follow the Lord, it's so easy to miss the mark. It's so easy to make it more complicated than what it actually is. Now, Rest of the story. It does have a good ending. Oh, yeah, rest of the story. Um, so the, I, I was just alongside of the pastor of this guy's life, which I, it was not actually Pastor Jason. The pastor of this guy's life, this young man comes back on fire for God. I did this, da, 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 you know, you know, I've been there. I learned this, and God spoke to me here, and it was amazing, and it was awesome. And, huh, pastor, so tell me about this. So how, how did God provide for you again? Um, well, uh... Well, I found this wallet <laughs> and it had $300 in it. And um, it was actually uh, Pastor Tom, Pastor Tom Eckhart. Tom, oh, yeah, Tom, you can imagine Tom. If anybody knows Pastor Tom, and he's such a fatherly guy, he's like, he's like, ah, oh, he's just like, I don't think you were hearing from the Lord. <laughs> and the guy's like, devastated. What do you mean? He's like, yeah, you got to call that guy. He's got, the kid's like, no, 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 I'm not calling that guy. He's like, you got to call that guy. Why? I'm like, you got to give that guy's wallet back and $300 back. 
And he, and, uh, he goes, well, I don't have $300. Pastor, Pastor Tom, I believe, actually gave the kid $300, sent the wallet back, and they had to call him, and the, guy had to, and the, the kid had to apologize. Now, that's good discipleship, right? That's, what, that's the kind of stuff he does, he makes us do, too. So you got to be careful going to him because he'll make you actually do stuff like that, right? That was the will of the Lord, right? But, hey, you know, was God worried about this young man tr- going for him? Like, I'm going to go on a guy's journey. No. Was he discouraged that he fell in a, a hole? No. He was ready for it. God was ready for him. And he got discipled and mentored and fathered, right? But I do feel like that. It is easy to go off the mark. So the question is, is how do we know what God's will is for any given situation, right? Because I can relate. I know it seems silly, but I can relate to that, the wallet story. I can relate to that young man. Like, oh, look, I found it. I found some money. <laughs> John 10.10. 10. Here's how we know. <laughs> she did steal my money. Oh, should I tell that story real quick? All right, total side note. <laughs> so one night, it was like Valentine's Day. Our sweet Addie has written cards to everybody in the family. Like really sweet cards, the hearts, and I love you, and unicorns and rainbows, everything that Addie thinks is great. And in those cards, there's $50 bills <laughs> in all those cards. Addie, under the unction of, of the Holy Spirit, had gone to my wallet and put $50 bills and handed it out to everybody on my behalf. <laughs> Yeah, no, it wasn't, Pastor Jason. It was awful. I'm like, where did, I'm like, I know. I, how I knew was, I was sitting in my my Jesus chair, probably doing something what I thought was spiritual, and uh, I get a card. I get a card, and I open this card. I'm like, oh, that's so nice. And I'm like, twenty bucks. You, where did my five year old get twenty bucks? I'm like, where's my wallet? <laughs> she gave them. The, she gave them all fifty bucks, and she gave me twenty bucks. I don't know what the. I don't know. There's a lesson there. I don't know. Some have to give me an interpretation of that story later. I don't even know what God was trying to show me there. But <laughs> All right. So how do we know God's will is what is, it's not God's will for Eddie to give my money away to other people without my permission. Okay. We got that established. So John 10, 10. So how do we know what God's will is in for any given situation? John 10, 10. A thief has one thing in mind. It's actually in here. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness to overflow. Lens is compare and contrast. Pharisee, the fruit of their life, the fruit of the people around them, versus the disciples. What was happening? They're bringing their mothers and their cousins and their fathers and I mean, anybody they could gather in. Why? Because there was real life there. The sheep know his voice. It's compelling. And the disciples were intimidated that they were gathering so many people. Right? Because they couldn't. They've not been able to do that. All right, so here we go. I've got six things. Six things. This is not an exhaustive list that help simplify whether or not it's the voice of the Lord. Number one, get saved by the Jesus of John 10.10. Who do you believe your Savior is? Is he, when you get saved, now do you have to follow a bunch of rules? Do you have to follow everything and do it perfectly to get it right, to feel the life of Jesus, the life of Jesus? Guess what? If that's it, I'm going to challenge you to get saved by the one that says this, but I have, have come to give you everything in abundance, more than you expect. Life in its fullness. We've got to bow at the feet of that Jesus. And if you've never bowed at the feet of that Jesus, that's the real Jesus, not the Antichrist Jesus. Talk to Pastor Jason or myself or one of the prayer team at the end of this, and we'll make sure you're invited to do that with that, with that Jesus. You can do it at home by yourself, too. Number two, so get saved by the Jesus of John 10.10. 10. Number two, I call it the righteousness, peace, and joy test. It comes from Romans 14, 17. By doing this or acting in this way, 
Okay, so look at it like this, kind of zoom out. Okay, so if you're like, okay, what's God's will for my life? Okay, we're going to get into some more nitty gritties. If you could just zoom out, just take a quiet moment of meditation, just zoom out a little bit and say, okay, if I do it this way, will it bring righteousness, peace, and joy into my atmosphere, into my influence? Okay, you read Romans 14, 17, that's where that comes. Number, I'm just going to rapid fire through this because you know what? just is. Number three, I could, number three, I call this the true religion test, whether or not this is the voice of God or not, right? Because I've struggled. Oh, God, is this you or is this not you? I've been there, man. This, the Pharisees were struggling with that, right? Is this you or not you? The true religion test is this, James 1, 27, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Period. That's it. How do you know if you're in God's will? You're taking care of the most, le- the least, the most vulnerable people in our society, and you're following the Ten Commandments. And he even made it simpler than that. He gave us two commandments, right? Love people and love God. Number four, I call this the love test. This actually kind of comes right on the back of the true religion test. Father God will never violate the law of, the law, law of loving God and loving your neighbor. Uh, my mom and my father instilled in me the golden rule. Who else has, been, has had the golden rule instilled in them? They know what the golden rule is. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, right? comes from Matthew. Um, ask yourself... This question, what does love look like in this situation? What would love do? And I could tell you, you're probably going to do what God wants you to do in that situation. Make it real practical. It's not complicated. What if my bicycle friend would have asked the question, what does love look like in this situation? Do unto others as I'd want them to do unto me. Would he have pocketed that $300? I want my money back, Eddie. <laughs> right? If I lose $300, that's a lot of money. I want that money back. I want somebody to show enough care and concern that I'm trying to provide for my family that they give me that wallet back and they come find me out. Right? What would love have done? My friend had such good intention going on this God journey. He had such good intentions going on this God journey. But, man, he missed it. And he got it because he's, you know, God's a good God, right? He loves us. He gets us out of the, the, you know, he gets us out of the ditch. I can relate to my young friend. Well, Angie, should I do the, uh, should I do the, the, the sponge story? All right. All right. I might run out of time for the other stuff, but all right. I can relate to my young friend. And some of you can, and too, I grew up. I got zealously saved on fire for God, young age said my prayers, did my fasting, gave my money away, all the things that we value so dearly, right? I was like, this is now fast forward a few years. I was probably, what, 20, what, when was it, 25, 26, when we first had Elijah? How old are we? He's probably, he's about one. Probably, he probably wasn't even a year old, old yet. And I felt such a weight that I wasn't getting it right with God. I felt like I just had to... Um, I, just, I felt this angst that I wasn't good enough. I wasn't doing enough to be spiritual or something. I don't even know. I'd have to look up my old journals, right? I just never felt like I was good enough. So I went on this fast. It was a fairly long fast, and I'm a skinny guy anyway. And, uh, yeah, Elijah's had to forgive me of a lot of things, right? And I go on this fast, and I, uh, I'm on the couch. I haven't eaten, and I'm wasting away, which I don't have much to waste away with anyway. And I'm just praying, as you can detest this, I'm praying, and, uh, making it miserable for everybody around me for, I don't know, a couple of days, right? Probably, it's probably, it's probably like six hours. I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> wasting away on the couch. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and, I, and I have this, I guess, um, almost like a movie play on my mind. I don't know what you exactly call this. So I'm sitting there and I'm in prayer and I'm like, oh, I got the breakthrough. I see this movie playing on my line and I'm, 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 and, and I'm laying down in this, and I see this giant yellow thing come at me, it's dripping with water right on my face. And I'm like, it was huge. It was like this. And I'm, I'm just like, oh God, am I not doing something right? Am I doing something right or wrong? And I'm just like so worried. I'm just going to miss it. Miss God. 
And, and he actually speaks to me very tenderly. He goes, he goes, and I had Elijah at the time, so this is very pertinent for my time off. He's just a little guy. And one of my jobs was to give him a bath. He's like, what do you think it looks like to get a bath from Elijah's perspective? Think about that. Like, I had these, I don't know if anybody washed their kids with those big yellow spongy things, right? That's what I would do. I'd get on the bath, and I'd be like, oh, and I'd wash up. But think about from a little guy's eye. I mean, the, the sponge is as big as he is. And God, what God was trying to show me is, is you're missing the mark in that, like, you just need to be a child. Stop with the fasting. Stop with the, the, the character. Just be my child. Amen. Right. I was, he was rescued. I mean, I was like, oh, I'm going to do a big fast. Boom, boom, right down in that pit. Father God's like, oh, I'm not too proud. I'll pull him out. Let me clean him up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I, I, I remember in that time, that time, the Lord's like, he's like, you could fast your way. You could fast all these things. He's like, you could fast your way right into hell. I'm like, huh. <laughs> so... You don't really care about how long I fast. Wow. I'm going to go get a chili hot dog or something. You know, I don't know. Like, I mean, my wife, my, my, my guy, I didn't listen to my wife. I didn't listen to my mom, my dad, certainly not my in-laws. You know, and they're just like, what is wrong with your husband, Angie? I, I don't even know. Like, you know what I mean? Like, but man, God saw it through it. And, and, and if you're feeling the condemnation, I just want to break it off. The name of Jesus, like, like seriously, like, we're trying. Like the Pharisees were trying; they were trying to please God, right? And, but in our zeal, when we take the focus actually into ourselves, we miss the mark because we got saved. It's complete. It's full. It may not feel like that all the time, but it's coming, right? It's actually about others. Number five, the same test, all right? Number one, two, three, four. First one, uh, get saved by the Jesus of John 10, the abundant Jesus. Two, the righteous peace and joy test. Three, the true religion test. Four, the love test. What does love look like? Number five, the Satan test. Um, so the theology of this is real quick, is Jesus does rebuke Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. So here's what this is. All right, so when you're asking the question of whether or not we're following God and his will, do you view it as a black and white, miss the mark, yes and no? This is a sign that you actually need a new paradigm. This is the way a Pharisee would have approached it. One of my pet peeves, and anybody that's been in our house around our table, one of my pet peeves I'm going to step, I might step on a few to, uh, toes. Is when somebody starts, the con, starts a, or ends a conversation by saying, God told me, fill in the blank. God told me who I was supposed to marry. God told me exactly which job to take. God told me I was supposed to be, was not supposed to be your friend. I've actually heard that one. All these I've heard from different people I've mentored. And I may have said them. God told me, I've heard it said, God told me to divorce my wife. God talk, told me to never talk to my family members again. I'm getting real here, right? <laughs> if you've been wounded by one of those things, I just pray for, for, just for healing over you right now. I just declare those relationships to be made clean. Amen. I've been personally hurt and beat up by those kind of things. Those are the wounds that hurt the most. Those are the persecutions that matter the most to me. Those are hard when a friend says, yeah, I can't be your friend anymore. Why not? Or a boyfriend or girlfriend breaks up with you. Yeah, I, I, can't, I can't be your boyfriend or girlfriend. Why not? God told me. What? He did? Really? Right? I mean, this is the stuff I feel like we just got to push out in the open as Christians. And especially one that, that believes in the Holy Spirit and following, that actually wants to talk to us and desires to talk to us. Is we just need to push this stuff out in the open. These kinds of statements and thoughts are tormentors and lead to condemnation, doubt, and guilt. A thief has one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. Does the shepherd care about who you're supposed to marry? What job you're supposed to, to be at? Absolutely, right? Listen to my first message. That's what it's all about. It's casting your heavy cares on him, the things that bother you down. 
It's not so much of so it's not so much who or what that matters the most to him. It's about the journey you take to get there. Think back to the wallet story, right? Was was that young man supposed to go to Star Rock? Absolutely. Why would I doubt that? But how is he supposed to get there? Righteousness, peace, joy through love. That's what I'm saying. It, is it hard sometimes? Will people reject us? Yes. But rejection isn't actually a sign that you're not one of his disciples. Here's the question you need to be asking. Did you do it in a way that, leaves, that brings love and honor? Are you willing to suffer to stay in that marriage? Are you willing to suffer for your child that's just not walking the right path? And it's hard. Or do you want to just cut them off? Or are you hiding behind the God card because you feel anxious and overwhelmed? Back to Jason's, what we've been talking about. I think sometimes we play that card because deep down we're scared and anxious. I feel like a lot of those Pharisees, they're just covering up, man. They're like, I feel really uncomfortable right now, so I'm going to come at it with a hammer. And that's what I do sometimes is because I'm scared. Right? But that's where we get saved. Those unsolvable problems. He wants us to cast those cares on him. God, I don't know. I'm confused. I, I just got dumped by so-and-so. They won't talk to me. My, my spouse is really angry at me, and I don't know why. My kids are really being tough on me right now. I don't know why. Right? Let's, let's move away from that God card paradigm. Um, one more on that one. I got I to gotta wrap it up. Actually, I'll skip. I'll do it for next time. Anyway, the, the, this, the, the, uh, he, back to the number five. So I never actually told the point of the number five, the Satan test. Okay. So, all right. So, <laughs> so let's take my friend, his wallet, and he gives it back, the money back, right? Would Satan tell him to give that money back? <laughs> I call it the Satan test. <laughs> Somebody's hurting out there on campus, right? Or you see them in the grocery store. You need to buy their groceries. Would Satan tell you? Would, would Satan tell you to buy their groceries? Probably not. I'm going to be real honest, right? Would Satan tell you to go pray for that person? <laughs> would Satan say, "Hey, go love on them and give them a hug"? No, he wouldn't say that, right? So I call the Satan test. Anybody that's been in our house, we use, we, call, we talk about that. Quite a bit. Number six test, the connection test. All right. What do you do if you feel overwhelmed? All right. So I just started up. If you look past, zoom out a little bit on why you're acting the way you're acting. And you're like, okay, I'm actually not angry. I'm actually feeling um, overwhelmed and fearful. And I'm covering it up with like religious anger. Like, okay, so now we've opened that up. Now you feel overwhelmed, right? Because you got this anxiety, right? The connection test, bring it to the body of Christ. That's where you're supposed to go with a lot of your issues. Let us be the hands and feet. Let us be the hands and feet to help you. Jesus will never lead you in a way that is in isolation from community, family, and friends. He's going to bring us together when he does heart surgery on us. And he decides, okay, I'm going to deal with a bad paradigm, our tough paradigm. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Today, you can be 100% in the will of God, even if you screwed it up every other day of your life. (laughs) Hallelujah, there's hope for me today. (laughs) My invitation is right here. My personal invitation is right here. How am I going to love these guys right here? How am I going to love people after I go about, well, when I walk out this door, right? It's not about whether you missed it or not. Today is a new day. That's why it says hope comes in the morning. Oh, you might have really screwed it up, but today's a new day. Fight. Fight to keep the gospel simple. Fight to keep following God simple. If it starts to get complicated, stop. Put a pause on it. Just take 15 minutes. Talk to somebody. Talk to one of your friends. Help them be like, hey, what am I missing here? And pray that you've built relationships in a way that people will be honest with you. Jason is 100% honest with me. My wife is 100% honest with me. My kids are 100% honest with me. I hope. They can tell me if they're not. Right? We want that. 
All right, here's my six things. Number one, get saved by the Jesus of John 10, 10. The righteousness, peace, and joy test. Number three, the true religion test. Number four, the love test. Number five, the Satan test. And number six, the, the connection test. Woo, I got through it all. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You've been a great uh, audience. It's been so much fun to talk to you guys today. I want to do a declaration. I'm not going to do a big, long one today. I've got three statements that we're going to do together. We're just going to declare it, okay? The first one is an I believe statement. It's declaration time, all right? Number one is, I believe that anyone can hear from God. Ready? I believe that anyone can hear from God. Number two, I believe that he wants to talk to me. <laughs> okay, all right, here we go. All right, here we go. One, two, three. I believe that he wants to talk to me. And number three, I believe that his voice sounds like love. You guys ready? I believe that his voice sounds like love. Thank you so much. All right. Should I dismiss everybody or what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lord. I'm just going to be taking these notes. I think. Hey, you can have them, yeah. Thanks. Except you can't license them, all right? <laughs> hey, uh, first of all, wasn't that awesome, guys? Amen. Thank you, Luke. Hey, just a reminder for everybody, next weekend is a ginormous weekend here at Journey. I know Pastor Josh shared all this stuff, but just a reminder, Fall Festival, um, next Saturday, 3.30 to 7.30. Um, in our staff meeting, Pastor Clark, Pastor Josh, and I were talking and uh, um, Pastor Clark was saying it looks like rain. And um, Josh said, yep, and that'll be clearing up before we get there. So, or however you said it. So word of faith, I love it. And it's already looking really nice for Saturday. So I um, want to encourage you, just come, bring friends. Um, we had a couple hundred or more people last year. It's just a good time. Um, and uh, what was the second thing I wanted to remind you all? Give me a second. Having a senior moment. Oh, shoot. Okay, I can't... Re oh, yeah, now I remember. Tom Harmon. How many of y'all know Tom Harmon? Tom Harmon, again, he's going to be speaking next weekend. He called me. Tom said, um, uh, Jason, me and Joyce, so his wife Joyce, we're going to be in Danville um, with some friends, and we just want to come down and, and be a part of Journey that, that day and just sit. And I said, man, we want to have you come down and be a part of Journey and not sit. Um, would you be willing to share the word? And he was humbled and honored. And guys, if you've not experienced Tom Harmon, he's a mentor of mine, um, uh, late 60s, early 70s, incredible, incredible man of God. And I just, I just don't, if you ever don't miss a Sunday, don't miss next Sunday. It's going to be amazing. So Father, we just bless you. We thank you for, for Luke and just this, this word that uh, he just shepherded us with today. God, I just declare that you are going to help us make incredible decisions Lord God, and that we will hear your voice. Thank you, God. And I just speak to that truth that uh, Luke already spoke, God, that we are your sheep. We will hear your voice. Just say it. I will hear your voice. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have an awesome day. See you at Saturday at the Fall Fest, all right?